Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen, we'll have more on markets in a moment. But first, a global diplomatic effort is underway to try to avoid a full-blown regional war in the Middle East. Iran fired more than 300 drones and missiles at Israel over the weekend. Almost all of them were intercepted before they reached Israeli airspace. We get more from Israel Bureau Chief Ethan Bronner in Tel Aviv. The fact that there were not, there was not any death here. There was a seven-year-old girl who's fighting for her life uh, who was hit by shrapnel. But other than that, no casualties and no genuine damage uh, to its uh, military uh, facilities that were attacked. Uh, That has given uh, Israel a sense of accomplishment and relief and not a need for instantly responding. Uh, And then those other factors were playing a role, which is there's some fatigue uh, and there's some desire to not alienate the United States. Israeli Bureau Chief Ethan Bronner reporting from Tel Aviv. Israel's President Isaac Herzog says his country is still considering its response, but there will be one. This is a declaration of war, not because we are restrained and because we know the repercussions and because we have deliberations with our partners, we are considering all options. We are not war seekers. And Herzog's comments came as Tehran sought to draw a line under the attack, which it says was retaliation for the strike on its diplomatic compound in Damascus earlier this month. Well, at an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres called on all sides to de-escalate tensions. Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. Guterres's call was echoed by G7 leaders in a statement they condemn what they described as Iran's direct and unprecedented attack against Israel and said they will now work to stabilize the situation and avoid further escalation. And that message of de-escalation is being echoed by the White House, Karen. National Security spokesman John Kirby made the rounds on the Sunday political shows to send that message. Here he is on ABC's This Week. Iran responded in an unprecedented way. Israel uh, defended in a truly unprecedented, remarkable way. Uh, uh, We don't want to see this situation escalate further. But House Intelligence Chair Mike Turner says the White House needs to recognize the conflict is already escalating. He was on NBC's Meet the Press. If this administration fails to step up to the plate and understand that we have an escalating conflict and make it clear to Iran that there are red lines and that the United States will defend uh, Israel and will not allow Iran to become a weapon state, that we will be in a broader conflict yeah. and we will have less options. And meanwhile, House Speaker Mike Johnson's promising a vote on aid to Israel this week. He's indicating funds for Ukraine could be part of the package. House Foreign Affairs Chair Michael McCall tells CBS's Face of the Nation Ukraine needs to be included. What I need to educate my colleagues, they're all tied together. I mean, Iran is selling this stuff to Russia. Guess who's buying Iran's energy? China. And you know why? Because we we lifted or waived the sanctions that we had, this administration, on the drones and, and the missiles and on the energy. And you can hear Face the Nation, Meet the Press, and This Week every Sunday on Bloomberg Radio. Well, Nathan, oil is shrugging off Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel. In fact, prices are lower on speculation that the conflict would remain contained. And we get more from Bloomberg Saudi Bureau Chief Christine Burke. There is a sense out there that the conflict will remain a bit contained, just given that Iran's strike on Israel did not inflict massive damage. But that does not mean that we are in the clear by any means. Any means this is still a pretty dangerous situation. Uh, even so, um, this sense that things may not immediately worsen seems to be what's driving markets this morning. And I think when it comes to crude in particular, uh, we have to remember that there was a bit of a, a war risk premium that was baked into prices heading into the weekend. And Bloomberg Saudi Bureau Chief Christine Berg says the region produces about a third of the world's crude. And checking oil right now, NYMEX crude oil is down 1.1 percent at $84.68 a barrel, while Brent is at $89.53. 
Well, Karen, let's shift gears now and turn to the criminal case involving Donald Trump. That gets underway today, and Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines is covering it for us in New York. Donald Trump's historic New York criminal trial begins today, the first ever for a former U.S. president. He's charged by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records, allegedly concealing hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. Trump will be legally required to attend as a criminal defendant despite his ongoing presidential campaign. Campaign. He has pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. The proceedings today begin with jury selection, which could last up to two weeks. The trial in total could last up to eight. In New York, Kaylee Lines, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Kaylee, thanks. Well, turning to Wall Street, bank earnings continue this morning with Goldman Sachs reporting. They follow Friday's results from J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. Ellison Williams is a senior analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. We're expecting to see a cleaner result than that which we've seen over the past few quarters. We expect trading and fees to remain relatively resilient for the bank, and we did get solid results for fixed income and equities trading a little bit better on the equities trading side from J.P. Morgan and Citigroup last week. We also are expecting to see good growth in banking fees. However, M&A is the weak spot and Goldman is a leader in that business. And Bloomberg Intelligence Allison Williams says a look for Goldman earnings at 7.30 a.m. Wall Street time. And look for runners to reach the starting line in Boston this morning, Karen, for the 128th running of the Boston Marathon, a full-scale return to the Patriot State tradition. The event shifted to a virtual format and limited attendance during the COVID era. Get details from Bloomberg Boston Bureau Chief Brooke Sutherland. The Boston Marathon is one of the world's oldest, dating all the way back to the late 1890s. But more than 30,000 runners and their fans will be back in full force this year. The Chamber of Commerce is expecting a $200 million economic impact from the marathon, comparable to a Super Bowl. Hotel rooms are in short supply and restaurants are booking up. Many of the participants are also running to raise money for charities. Bank of America is now the race's primary sponsor, succeeding John Hancock. In Boston, I'm Brooke Sutherland for Bloomberg News. Okay, Brooke, thank you. And the Boston Athletic Association is organizing the race, which will see competitors vie for the coveted title and substantial prize purse of $1.2 million. The historic 26.2-mile race stretches from Hopkinton to the heart of Boston at Copley Square. It is one of the world's oldest annual marathons. It kicks off 9 a.m. Wall Street time. Stay with Bloomberg for updates throughout the morning. It's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's John Tucker. John, good morning. And good morning, Karen. The pool of prospective jurors in Donald Trump's criminal trial here in Manhattan will be asked some wide-ranging questions today. Let's find out more about that angle of the story from Bloomberg's Denise Pellegrini. New York Supreme Court Justice Juan Merchant is describing the jury questionnaire as broad and exhaustive. It consists of 42 numbered questions, many of which contain multiple sub-questions. And this includes whether they ever attended a rally or campaign event for Trump, whether they're a supporter or member of the QAnon movement, the Proud Boys or other similar groups, and where they get their news from. Notably, though, they will not be asked if they like Trump, a question that the judge says is irrelevant because it does not go to the issue of the prospective jurors' qualifications. Denise Pellegrini, Bloomberg Radio. The NYPD deployed additional officers to Jewish places of worship after Iran attacked Israel with those drones and missiles. In response to the attack, Mayor Adams wrote on X, as mayor of the largest Jewish population in the world outside of Israel, the significance of Iran's attack for Jewish New Yorkers, many of whom have family in Israel, is not lost on me, especially with Passover just days away. A police officer and a sheriff's deputy in upstate New York were shot and killed last night in an exchange of gunfire with a suspect. It happened in Liverpool, just north of Syracuse. Police Chief Joseph Cecile says the officers have been tracking a vehicle that had gotten away from police. While they were inspecting the vehicle and saw what looked to be guns inside, they heard what, it, what sounded like uh, someone manipulating a firearm from inside the residence. The suspect was also killed. And 11 people standing outside a family gathering Saturday night were shot in what Chicago police believe was gang-related violence on the south side of that city. Four victims were children. An eight-year-old girl was killed. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you wanted with Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker. This is Bloomberg. Nathan Karen. All right, John, thank you. 
It's time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update with John Stashauer. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Scotty Scheffler went to Augusta Red Hot. Recent wins at Bay Hill, the Players' Championship, and over the course of the Masters, he showed why he's the best golfer in the world right now. Never had a round over par. He broke free after there was an early four-way tie for the lead. He won by four shots. His second green jacket in the last three years while his competitors faltered. Scheffler remained steady. I wasn't thinking about that much. I was doing my best to stay in the moment, stay calm, execute shots. I was very focused out there today. I felt like I did a really good job. You know, Teddy did a great job of making sure that we kept the golf course in front of us. You know, I didn't get off to the, the best start, but had some key up and downs. Ludwig Oberg, the 24-year-old Swede who had never played a major before, finished second. Three-way tie for third. Tommy Fleetwood, Max Homa, and Colin Morikawa. Homa and Morikawa had final rounds of 73 and 74. At the Garden, thrilling finish to the Knicks regular season. They beat Chicago by one point in overtime. Jalen Brunson scored 40. Knicks finished with 50 wins, and with some help, they gave the two seed in the East. They'll play the winner of Wednesday's play-in game between Philadelphia and Miami. The Celtics finished 64 and 18. They'll play whoever ends up as the eight seed. The Nets' final record was 32 and 50. The Wizards went 15 and 67. The Warriors have a play-in game tomorrow at Sacramento. The winningest regular season in Rangers history ends tonight at the Garden against Ottawa. If the Rangers get a 55th win, they win the President's Trophy. Dwight Gooden Day at City Field after his number 16 was retired. Fittingly, a pitcher's duel. Mets top Kansas City 2-1 to one. in Cleveland. A wild one. The Yankees got an early three-run homer from Aaron Judge. Clutch hits late from Anthony Volpe and then Anthony Rizzo. But the Guardians, three runs in the 10th inning to beat the Yanks 8-7. to seven. John Stash Hour, Bloomberg Sports. Karen Nathan. All right, John, thank you. And S&P futures up half percent this morning, up about 28 points. Dow futures up three-tenths of a percent, or 117 points. NASDAQ futures up six-tenths of a percent, or 107 points. And the 10-year Treasury yield at 4.54 percent. Coast to coast on Bloomberg Radio, nationwide on Sirius XM, and around the world on Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. The world is racing to avert a wider conflict in the Middle East following Iran's unprecedented weekend attack on Israel from its own soil involving hundreds of drones and missiles, nearly all of which were shot down by Israel and its allies. Joining us from Tel Aviv this morning is Bloomberg Israel economy and government reporter Galit Altstein. Galit, good morning. Good morning. So the uh, market uh, appears to be uh, seeing a a sense of calm here uh, this morning after the weekend attack. Is that being reflected by what you're seeing in Israel right now? Um, Yes, I think that um, the bottom line is that so far we've seen um, no response from Israel to Iran's attack that you mentioned. And we've also heard no public comment that gives us any sense um, that there is going to be a a response. We've also not been hearing that um, there won't be a response, but uh, we haven't been hearing any um, explicit comments from the um, people who are in charge of making these decisions in Israel. So, um, so far, um, everything seems um, pretty uh, quiet. Beyond that, I would say um, that um, Israel is having a big dilemma deciding on how to uh, how to respond to this unprecedented at- attack by Iran um, on Israel from Iranian soil. This is a first, of course. And um, Israel um, is keeping the cards close to its chest uh, in, in a sense. We know that there is a very narrow form of five of five member war cabinet that is led by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that was authorized to determine what the response will be. And they met yesterday for several hours to discuss this. We're not aware that the final decision um, was made at this um, stage, but it is evident that Israel is taking the time to carefully weigh um, the dilemmas. Now, we did hear from uh, Israeli military spokesperson Peter Lerner on Bloomberg Radio this morning saying that the Israeli army has presented the government with possible responses to the attack. Do we have an idea of what the options are that the war cabinet uh, could be considering? Well, you know, we haven't been hearing anything public on this. Um, I would say that, you know, Israel has um, a wide um, array of um, things that it can um, do militarily if it decides to, um, from the air, also uh, possibly, um, you know, possible cyber attacks, um, perhaps, 
um, and so forth. But I think that um, maybe an important point to make is that um, uh, regardless and with respect to the um, options that the military has presented to the to the cabinet and to the war cabinet that I mentioned um, just now, um, there is a lot of um, diplomatic pressure on Israel um, to refrain from uh, responding at all but by the United States, first and foremost. But we also know that this is the message that came out of the G7 talks yesterday. So, uh, and, and I think it's um it's worthwhile noting because um Israel um um maybe reports here say that one of the plans that has been put on the table apart from the military plans that you mentioned is perhaps the idea of maintaining the coalition that we saw help defend in Israel headed by the by the US but also um with some European countries and some reg- um, countries in the region so perhaps if that coalition can be maintained at least in part to um um advance a diplomatic um, move that will um, lead eventually to, to impose further economic sanctions on Iran, aiming to thwart or slow down its nuclear program. That is something that Israel would probably like very much. And if there are talks on that, and if some 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 of that can be achieved, I think that to some extent that could influence what Israel does in the military aspect, in aspect in response to Iran's attack. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.